I feel compelled to pause my examination of racism and realism in favor of a uh, thought triggered by a uh, section of uh, the first chapter of Gaetano Mosca's The Ruling Class. Um, what I think we could describe as the Mosca Trap, or what Mosca himself would call Francis Bacon's folly. I think this idea captures Abstracting from this idea would capture what I think is a primary problem that we experience with intellectuals in their current socio-political order, in which they come up with all these solutions based on theories that are quite inadequate for the purpose they would wish to appropriate them for, to appropriate them to solve. Right. Um, yeah. So, yes. Uh, in uh, in that first chapter, and uh, yeah, when he was discussing political science, Moscow says, or writes rather, the mere use of observation and experience within a given order of phenomena does not in itself truly assure, does not in itself assure truly scientific results. Francis Bacon has mistaken as to the absolute capacity of the experimental method for discovering scientific truth and many thinkers and writers of our day are under the same illusion. Uh, I think the same idea would be captured if I could uh, quote a Marxist right, uh, from E.P. Thompson's 1978 essay when he was, yeah, his essay, The Poverty of Theory, right, even though he's writing for a different purpose, right, he's He's objecting to a different phenomena that he is noticing in the Marxist movement, right? Um, but he he notes that that there's an epistemology derivative from a limited kind of academic learning process, and has no general validity. And as a result of that, the person he's critiquing has no category or way of handling experience. Uh, basically, I think that would be saying a theory that you can't apply in the real world even though it might be theoretically valid. Uh, so, how do I formulate this problem? Uh, how do I describe it? I think it'd be captured with uh, an idea from economics, or well, Eco 101, like the, usually in the first uh, economics class, right? In my introduction to microeconomics, right? Um, then now, um, people were introduced to the concept of ceteris paribus, when they're discussing the law of supply and demand, right? Uh, so why do they want to restrict things to ceteris paribus, Every, uh, everything else constant, or things held constant, constant or other factors constant? Uh, it's an intellectual tool to help the student grasp uh, the logical connection between two interrelated phenomena, right? Uh, because if you try to think of it at the same time with every other factor in question, it has this obscuring effect whereby you cannot see what the connection is or what the relationship is. So you can understand the relationship between supply and demand, right? If you look at those two things alone when everything else is held constant. But then now try to understand the relationship between supply and demand. At the same time, it's being affected by religion. It's been affected by individual greed. It's been affected by personal ambition. It's been affected by politics, geography, history, and technology. If you're thinking of all those factors at the same time, making sense of supply and demand, of the law of supply and demand, becomes much more difficult, right, and much harder to follow. Um, another way I could uh, formulate the problem is uh, the mathematics necessary for Newtonian mechanics is different from the one that would be necessary for string theory or one that looks to describe quantum mechanics, right? Uh, the shapes you're working with in Newtonian mechanics will be quite different from the shapes you might be forced to work with in string theory. You can draw some of the shapes necessary that you're working with Newtonian mechanics. You d cannot have like a 3D, like you cannot, how do you draw a six dimensional object or a seven dimensional object? The most you can symbolically represent it on a three dimensional space or through a mathematical formula. Uh, if you take that to the humanities, let's consider the, so you notice now I'm, cons I'm, I'm separating the effort that one is making to understand an idea or a concept in an academic setting and I'm contrasting it as trying to reinsert that concept and apply it to the world. 
So let's assume that um, you grant uh, intersectionality, right? Uh, when people are talking about gender, it's a popular concept in gender studies, right? Uh, so let's say in a gender and epistemology class, right? And uh, you introduced intersectionality, right? And you can grant that that can be true in an individual case, right? Uh, like if you're a black, yeah, let's say you're a black woman and study next to a black man, you will be treated differently, right? If you're a blind black woman and a lame black man, you will be treated differently. Your experience and interaction with people will be different. Uh, that, that will be a factor in how they perceive you and how they respond to you. But then to take that and you make it a general case, right? And you're trying to understand the lifetime interactions of a person or of a group of people, of a population. So let's say you're trying to understand the experience of all women. And you're trying to use this concept, this academic tool, intersectionality, to formulate policy. Surely it cannot be the only lens by which we justify a policy because the inter human interaction has so many other factors coming into play. It is more than just your physical appearance or their perception of you. There's the whole dimension of the different beliefs, uh, cultural practices. That there's so many factors that are interrelating and affecting the interaction between the two people. This one idea cannot be adequate. Right? Uh, so, for instance, like, um, let's look at second wave feminism, right? Um, and a section of its seminal text. Um, the Second Sex by Simone Beauvoir. Now, how does she fall into the Moscow trap, right? Um, she, she, when she's thinking through the experience of women, right? And she is trying to abstract this, the reason why she, she, that men are dominant, in her perception that the men are dominant over women. And how, what, and she's trying to, and she's reflecting on to why this is the case. She has an intuition on it. And the answer she arrives to is because of what she describes as reproductive slavery, right? Uh, and that um, and participation in production, right? So she sees these are the two issues, and um, and she she does follow a line of reasoning, right? But then she is ignoring every other factor. Every other factor is ceteris paribus, right? Um, and to her, the population of family starts looking like the oppression of women, which is a really radical conclusion, I guess, and hence the idea of radical feminism. And you can, it could also help you understand why some of them tend to be very anti-family, right? Or you can extend the same, same uh, idea of the Mosca trap affecting um, Judith Butler, right? Who is tr making the distinction on between gender and sex, right? Uh, she's, what she's describing as a radical understanding of gender, right? And, um, and it's based on this idea it, uh, in the second sex, right? that you're not born a woman, you become a woman, right? And therefore, woman is the gender thing, but then female will be the sex, I guess. But then this process of maturation and education within the juvenile human female, right? She perceives it as a purely social process, right? Like it's purely a product, like there are no biological factors involved in it, unless I'm misunderstanding her, right? But then this radical understanding of gender is purely based on an intuition. So for us to extend that into the real world and build policies off, off of it, and ignoring all the other factors affecting this phenomena, surely that would be irrational or foolish, right? Or you can take like uh, some of the effects of the sexual revolution. I could make the argument that um, Ricky Rodriguez is a victim of the sexual revolution. That these things have very real world consequences with factors that are beyond people's capacity to compute. Who would have thought that uh, a cult leader would latch upon the ideals or ideas of the sexual revolution, bring it on to form into his own cult, take this baby boy and expose that child to sexual abuse throughout the child's development to the point of the child's adulthood, he is so broken he eventually resorts to suicide and murder in an attempt to 
to grapple with the horrors he had witnessed. And so this idea or ideology within an intellectual movement, finding support within a section of the ruling class, ends up having such a horrible impact that affects multiple people and evolves in the death of two people that they didn't plan for or they couldn't even possibly predict with the assumptions that they were working by. Right, uh, we take extend this whole idea, the same Moscow trap idea to Foucault and Marx, right? Uh, so you could argue that Foucault is deconstructing the French liberal order, right? And why would I think that? It's because um, it's perhaps he's not going far enough into the past or wide enough to cultures beyond Europe right uh like there's that speculatory frame of what he's doing right that seem and some of his conclusions seem to be too myopic right and yet he is one of the most cited scholars by but yeah he, he sociologists cite him a lot according to Gulen Solo, right he's one of the most cited writers or thinkers by sociologists right and so even if we grasp Grantee's observation and theories, what about the other factors, other forces, right, that are in play, right? Uh, when, he, he, when him and the like-minded people are there arguing for the erasure of age of consent laws, are they consider, putting into consideration other factors and forces aside from the conclusions they came through v via their own academic inquiry, uh, the academic project, which involved Ceteris Paribus, ignoring the other factors, extracting them, right? Uh, to the point that he could even make the claim, no, there's no good or bad subjectivity, since to him all of this is reducible to power relations, right? Uh, surely there is more to reality, to objective reality, beyond phenomenology, psychoanalysis, and Marxism, right? Or the yeah, we can extend that further. Like, um, uh, what is it? Yeah, uh, Joel Davis and um, Jill, they were having this discussion. They were exploring um, the juveniles on power, right? And they were contrasting his account of political power, right? And contrasting it with Marx's account. And showing, I think, quite convincingly that Marx was wrong, that economic control was not the driving force, but rather political security. Economic control emerges from political security, right? And because he's so, Marx is so stuck on this limited set of factors, he ends up ignoring all those other factors when you try to apply Marx into the real world. So you might be able to understand and make sense of the intuition he's having, the concept he's describing, what he's thinking about, right? It's a special special type of knowledge, right? But then it's another thing to take that special knowledge and reintegrate it to the real world, to objective reality, right? And so I think it takes us to the warnings that Thomas Sowell was giving us, right? Like, um, in or some of the warnings that you'd find Thomas Sowell communicates in his book, Intellectuals and Society, right? One of the things he's wanting us to be wary, to be wary of language games, right? Uh, and he says that what one of the many signs of verbal virtuosity amongst these intellectuals is the repackaging of words to mean things that they are, that are not only different from but sometimes the direct opposite of the original meanings, right? Uh, so when you're trying to when let's say the notion of freedom is one of the things that he discusses, right? Um, uh, yeah, like what people mean by freedom and what an intellectual might mean by freedom. Or uh, like when they talk about in the abortion debate when they discuss uh, bodily autonomy, right? Um, is like, are you talking about the same concept? Is it what is being presented in the political sphere? Uh, yeah, so it also notes that um, if facts, logic, and scientific procedures are all just arbitrarily, arbitrarily socially constructed notions, then all that is left is consensus, more specifically peer consensus, the kind of consensus that matters to adolescents or to many among the intelligentsia, right? Uh, so he's painting this idea, at, I think it's a critique to the post-structuralists, right? Um, so whereby they argue that all these things are just social constructions and they're arbitrary, 
right? They don't see them as axiomatic, right? Um, whereby it's starting off with some observations. They don't see it as mathematics, right? Where you start off like, uh, like let's say the associative property of uh, of numbers, right? One plus like one plus two equals to two plus one, right? So to them they're not seeing axioms. For them it's just arbitrary, right? And Sowell is warning us that we should move up. Like, it's a trap, right? It's an intellectual trap. Uh, we should call this the Moscow trap, right? Uh, oh, how he wants us not to confuse special knowledge with all knowledge, right? We should take note that wisdom is not intellect. What does Sowell say? The ignorance, prejudices, and groupthink of an educated elite are still ignorance, prejudice, and groupthink. And for those with 1% of the knowledge in a society, to be guiding or controlling those with the other 99% is as perilous as it is absurd, right? Uh, many intellectuals and their followers have been unduly impressed by the fact that highly educated elites like themselves have far more knowledge capa capa cap per capita in the sense of special knowledge than does the population at large. From this, it is a short step to considering the educated elites to be superior guides to what should and should not be done in a society. They have often overlooked the crucial fact that the population at large may have vastly more total knowledge in the mundane sense than the elites, even if that knowledge is scattered in individually unimpressive fragments among vast numbers of people. Right? When people say follow the science, you know, um, when it's purely just about trust the experts, that the experts are supposed to give us input, information, they're supposed to give us insight. But then, what does the individual do thereby, right? If you have adequate wisdom, right? If you have adequate understanding of the real world, you should be able to weigh your options and pick what would be the most appropriate course of action. It's not blind following, right? It's rather adding, to their, wis adding their wisdom and learning to yours and then coming to a judgment as to what action to take, right? And just uh, in case I just get hit on that, yes, you're only quoting right wingers, and that problem is a propaganda attack. Um, let me, yeah, let me co-opt a par a statement right by a Marxist right who was critiquing, uh, who was arguing, who was having a debate with other Marxists about um, how they're making sense of. Actually, it was in, in history, right? He's a Marxist historian. All right. Um, this is not to say knowledge is finite or subject to some proof of positivistic scientism. Nor is it to suppose that the advance has been unlinear, unilinear, uh, sorry, has been unilinear or unproblematic. Sharp disagreements exist and complex problems remain, not only unsolved but scarcely even disclosed. It is possible that the very success of historical materialism as a practice has encouraged a conceptual lethargy, which is now bringing down upon our heads its necessary revenge. And this is the more, po and this is the more possible in those parts of the English-speaking world where a vigorous practice of the historical materialism has been conducted within an inherited empirical idiom of discourse, which is reproduced by strong educational and cultural traditions. Right? So even he is noting, right, that there's this type of intellectual myopia, right, that can seize an intellectual elite or seize a group of people or seize a discipline, right? And I would argue that many of the issues that we struggle with, the things that make us dissidents, right, are we're able to see some of these negative outcomes or some of these intellectual blind spots that these things being put forward bring about. And therefore, these people are want to radically reshape society based on a myopic view of concept theories and ideas of a special nature at, and taking it divorced to the wider reality that they have to contend with, the wider world that they're living in. And so when you're dealing with critics of dissidents, right, it is good to note, and even when, if you, even if you are going through your own thought life as a dissident or as a reactionary, you want to be careful not to fall into the Moscow trap, right? Um, 
reality is like phenomena is much more interrelated it's a unified whole right and it's a whole that is more than the sum of its parts a mastery of the part is an inadequate description of the whole it's like trying to describe a human being by totally by a total description of the kidney you might describe the organ the structures genetic makeup but that is still a poor reflection of the human being reality is i experienced as a unified whole not as fragmented unrelated phenomena and so what would be what would i say as and this is particularly manifest in the political left of our time these are people who that are so caught within the mosca trap that they are incapable of seeing that reality does not care about our beliefs or imagination you do not build a house based on your sentiments right uh material science is not arbitrary there are natural forces in operation and you have to flow in accordance to them right there's a logos to the world and if you reject this logos there are severe consequences to it you do not chop off the genitalia of a child and don't think it will have repercussions in the future right in doing ballet look at the feet of the ballerina the cost of standing in that unnatural manner has physical consequences to the body and so let's be careful and wary of the mosca trap in our intellectual lives